Good morning, Faith Fellowship. Happy Sabbath to each one of you, and good morning to Faith Fellowship Online. I pray that you joined us in prayer. We, we pray for all of you uh, each time that we're together, and we are so happy to have you join us this morning. I am so excited to continue our study on Psalm 23, A New Look. I know that you have been blessed as you have looked at your shepherd in a whole new way. I can tell you that I continue to be amazed as I look again at scriptures that I've read many times, but that are just coming off the page uh, just in, in a different way. And so I, I hope that each one of you is blessed as you listen to the Holy Spirit this morning and to the specific things that he wants to um, the, the road, the path that he wants to lead you on. So let's begin with prayer together. Amazing Lord, we are so grateful for this time together. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to be with us, to open up our hearts and minds for the very specific things that you have to say to each one of your sheep. We ask that you would be with each one of our family members, especially the ones that aren't here today. And we also want to remember uh, our dear brother Larry as he has his surgery this week, Lord, we ask that you would draw near to him and the rest of his family. We know and trust that you are at their side. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you said this enough this week? The Lord is my shepherd. Let me hear you say it again. The Lord is my shepherd. Have you told anyone about your shepherd this week? Because if you've had any chance, I hope that you are reminding yourself and them that because he's your shepherd, you have everything that you need. Yes, that's a very good point that we need to remind ourselves of is that God provides what we need. He also calms my fears so that I can rest. We live in a world that is full of challenges and circumstances, and we need to be able to lie down in green pastures, and our God certainly does that for us. Our shepherd deals with us when we are upside down. He knows how to help us when we get in the worst and unbelievable circumstances that we can find ourselves in. Imagine how such a little bitty hole could be such a problem for a big, giant sheep. Wow, have you ever found yourself in such a situation? It didn't seem like it could possibly be that big of a problem. How did I fall into such a deep hole? It didn't seem like it was that big of a deal. Our shepherd is amazing in how he restores us and he leads us to lie down in green pastures. Wow. Now, the second half of Psalm 23 is addressing the journey that the sheep go on with the shepherd as he leads them to very distant, faraway summer ranges. And so we're going to sort of shift our, our focus. This is a time when the shepherd is alone with his sheep. A very, very personal time. The shepherd desires close, intimate contact with every one of his sheep. And what I love about this is this is why he leaves in 99. Because this is how he feels toward, totally in love with every single sheep. And so 99 is not enough. He will go after that one because he loves us each so amazingly. Many shepherds take their flocks to very distant ranges, and it's a lot of work for a shepherd to take his sheep. They're going to have to go through dangerous territory to reach, to get from one pasture to another, and to get to good water and to good pasture. The shepherd is fully aware of where he is taking his sheep. Though sometimes our lives look like creepy valleys, God is always there and he knows exactly 
where he's taking us. And why do the sheep get moved? Remember from last week, sheep need to keep moving because they will stay in a rut and just wear down one path and they have to be kept moving. So your shepherd is always needing to move you around and deal with different things in your character and your mind and your heart so that he can get you to where he wants for you to be. God's never surprised by anything. He knows exactly what up ahead looks like. And so we need not worry. The, the drives make the, the flock very thirsty because it's very hot. And so these are things I want you to get into your mindset as we look ahead to the next part of this psalm. The, the shepherd takes the sheep through the valleys because it's where the water is. And the sheep need to have a lot of water during this time. I love this because perseverance, instead of looking at it as a long race, it's many short races. And you, you go through the valley, you get to the mountaintop, take a deep breath, guess what? Time to go down to another valley, climb up the mountain, guess what? Take a deep cleansing breath. This is the life of a Christian. It is, it is valleys and it is mountaintops back up and down, back and forth, until we get to the promised land, this is our life. And so we need to not give up. So let's get to verse four. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I think this is why this psalm gets used in funerals a lot because of this one line. But I want you to note what David says. I walk through. He's not dead. He is walking through the valley. Remember that this has a beginning and an ending point, this psalm. And so there's a whole story here. I walk, even though I walk through the darkest valley, that, that seems like the shadow of death because we as sheep are what? Scaredy cats. And so when we see a dark, creepy looking place, we become fearful. But David describes it as a shadow of death because it's full of possible danger and because we can't see what lurks in the shadows. When shepherds are taking their sheep through valleys, there's always dangers that exist. Like a sudden avalanche can just happen without, you know, without them even suspecting it. Or they can even have snow during that time that can cause a lot of issues for the sheep. So there's always danger, but the shepherd always knows. In some cases, the shepherd leads his sheep through ravines where wild animals hide. And the steep slopes of the, the hillside blocks the light, making a lot of shadows. And it can really be scary for the sheep. And they can absolutely be freaking out. But the only way to higher ground with our shepherd is to walk through the valleys. We never reach the mountaintops where we get the huge visions of God unless we walk through these, mountain, mountain, um, these valleys. But most of us don't want valleys in our lives. We just want to stay on the mountaintop. But it is during the valleys that the shepherd grows us, that he gives us what we need in strength and in courage, and that he grows our characters. Most of us don't want to deal with valleys, but valleys exist in all of our lives. And one of the biggest valleys that we can go through is a broken relationship. There, you know, our world is full of divorce and broken relationships, and that is a huge valley. It, it is a very dark place as is any kind of family strife. You know, parents not getting along, children not getting along with parents, siblings not getting along. There's, there's always, because we're all carnal, have carnal natures, there's always a possibility for strife, and it's a valley. It's something we have to work through and walk through with the Lord. How about losing a job? I mean, that is a valley. It brings uncertainty. How are we going to pay the bills? It can bring great frustration and, and depression. Losing a loved one and coping with grief is a huge valley. And it takes staying close to our shepherd and walking through the valley to be able to get through it. How about the many kinds of peer pressure that we can deal with in our lives? Or 
my attitude, which is always tied to me having to deal with my pride and God dealing with my pride, as well as broken trust, broken friendships, uh, trust in friendships. There's always, and you know, there's, there's hundreds more of different kinds of valleys that we go through and the things that we have to deal with. But the richest feed and the best forage is by the way of the valleys. The, the best of God that he wants to give us, the lessons that we learn, comes in walking through these valleys that sometimes seem like death. Our shepherd is always with us in these valleys, and he always knows what's up ahead. We never have to worry that something is going to catch him by surprise. So that is why David says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because thou art with me. Lord, you are with me. You will take care of me. You will sustain me. I don't need to be afraid. I am going to walk through this valley as hard as it may be, as, as, as scary as it may seem, I'm going to trust you because there's beauty in every valley if we're willing to look. And you will see beauty in your shepherd that you have never seen before. First and foremost, you will see how he takes care of you and how he sustains you in the valleys, and it will just absolutely lift your spirits. So stop fearing the valleys. Don't worry about the valleys. Just do what David said. He said, though it's creepy, I'm not going to be afraid. Even though I'm a scaredy cat sheep, I am going to trust you in this valley. Only those who have learned to depend on the shepherd can encourage and inspire the weaker ones. Let me talk to that for just a minute. It is so important that we learn the lessons that our shepherd has for us to learn in our valleys. Because we're not on this planet for our own good, for our own happiness, just to see how much that we can get out of living on this planet. We are created to glorify the Lord. That is our purpose. It doesn't matter what occupation you have. God, God doesn't care what you're doing. He cares who you are becoming. Who are you becoming? And he wants for you to learn these lessons, all the things that we just coped through. If you've been through a divorce, then guess what? God's going to be able to use you to help someone else who is coping with the same heartache. If you have lost a loved one, guess what? You have experience with God that no one else has. And you're going to be able to, he's going to be able to use you. You're going to be able to join him in this particular work. So no matter what, the, what you've been through, if you have gone through that experience, God has enabled you and equipped you and prepared you for something in the days to come. God prepares us today for tomorrow. And in the lessons that we've learned of how God has dealt with our pride and our arrogance and our greed and our selfishness, then we can help someone else and say, I learned this lesson. It was a tough lesson. But now I see God pointing things out and I don't go in that little hole that I get stuck in. I now learn to see, hmm, I think I'll walk a different path. See, we need to be so aware of what we're learning in the valleys. It's valuable to our shepherd that we can then be encouragers and help lift someone up. That is, that is how the Lord does. You and I become arms and legs and a mouthpiece for him and for his glory. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. How is that possible? Well, let's look at their two different things. Rods are relatively short, heavy, club-like devices for the most part. A staff is long and it has a hook on one end. And a shepherd uses his rod to protect both himself and his flock in danger. It's a source of protection. And so the sheep feel very comforted and at ease knowing that their shepherd is has what he needs to protect them. A shepherd's rod is also a symbol of his strength, his power, and his authority in any serious situation. 
It's also an instrument for discipline and correction for any wayward sheep that insisted on wandering away. A little nudge. David is greatly comforted in knowing that his shepherd can protect him in every situation. And so, the Bible is the rod of Jesus. There is great comfort and serenity for those who conduct themselves under God's word. To be right with the Lord because you're living according to his plumb line, ah, there is nothing better than that, to aspire to line up every day with the Lord. God's word can meet and master any kind of problem that we may face. Let's look at Hebrews 4. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God's word is powerful. Another use of the shepherd's hand was to examine and count the sheep. This was referred to as passing under the rod. This meant both coming under his authority and his most careful firsthand examination. You cannot pull the wool over God's eyes. And he says in Ezekiel 20, I will take note of you as you pass under my rod, and I will hold you to the terms of the covenant. The terms of the covenant. God is very clear in his covenant. If you will be my people, then I will be your God. So he takes note of his sheep as we pass under the rod of his correction, as he puts his, the plumb line of his word and lines us up, are we lining up? Because he says, if not, he will purge us. He will not be able to be a part of his flock. So if he's going to hold us to the covenant, we have to be aware that God is watching. He's looking. And we must stay very close to him by reading the word, by staying in prayer, so that we can, as much as is humanly possible, line up and live according to the covenant so that we say, Lord, yes, I want to be yours. I will be your sheep because I want for you to be my shepherd. The shepherd can see the condition of the sheep. We think that we can pull the wool over God's eyes and he doesn't see the parasites that are lurking within our bodies and the, the corruption that we have allowed. But the only way to stay honest before the Lord is to do what David did in Psalm 139, is to say, Lord, you search me. You see the corruption inside of me. You know my heart. You test my anxious thoughts. You see if there is anything offensive here, Lord, because I'm a sheep, and I like to look the other way, and I love to live in delusion, and I love to think that I'm okay. But I know that that is not where I need to be. So, Lord, search me and try me and show me. The shepherd's staff is a symbol of concern and long-suffering and kindness. The shepherd uses his staff to draw the sheep together into intimate fellowship like, you, like we have here. God uses his staff to, to have us an intimate um, relationship. So what might the staff represent? The staff is also used for guiding the sheep. So who is our staff? Who pulls us into intimate relationship? The Holy Spirit. He is the one who guides us and leads us into all truth. And one super great, awesome thing that the Lord showed me this morning is that his rod and his staff are the two witnesses. The Ten Commandments, the plumb line, and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? I just, ugh. God is always giving out amazing nuggets. And with his Holy Spirit, he, he uses his sweet Holy Spirit to get us out of a lot of trouble. 
because greedy sheep get themselves in trouble all the time for just wanting that one little bite over the fence. And the Lord, our shepherd, he sends his Holy Spirit. He uses his rod to lift us up and to get us out of trouble. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I have to say that this particular uh, verse out of this psalm has just really impacted me. I, I, I don't know what it is about seeing this in a whole new way, but I hope that you are just a, even just a smidgen of blessed as I was. A table uh, in, in David's language was the, the summer range. You know, there were many summer ranges, wonderful um, pasture for the sheep. From the sheep's perspective, it's, it's a suitable land for grazing. The shepherd takes a lot of work to prepare these faraway distant summer ranges. He has to go out there and he has to make sure to clear out stuff that doesn't need to be there. Stuff's grown over there all year like um, po poisonous plants that might seem beautiful, but there are certain plants in certain ranges that imagine taking a bite of a flower and becoming immediately paralyzed and dying. The shepherd has to know the ground, has to know um, all of the dangers, and he, he does his best to remove every single danger that he can. He also goes out there ahead of time and puts out salt and minerals for the sheep in different places so that they're fully prepared to be out there for, for a long period of time. Another chore the shepherd has to do is clean out water holes and drinking places for a sheep so that they will have everything they need when they're far away from home uh, and so that he can provide all that, that is needed. Though the shepherd makes every possible provision for the safety and welfare of his sheep, it does not mean that they're not going to have trouble. See, a lot of people think that the mountaintops of, with God are trouble-free. I just want to go to the mountaintop, but that's, that's not really true. A storm can come up in an instant. The day was sunny and, you know, the birds were singing, everything was beautiful, and here comes a dark cloud up over the mountain. Danger exists even in the best and the richest of tablelands. If the sheep wander off, they are very easy prey for predators. The shepherd knows it doesn't take much to frighten the sheep. It's who we are. All someone has to say one thing and there they all go. Jesus has told us, in this world, you might have trouble. You will have trouble. But take heart. That means be of good courage, scaredy cat sheep. Have some courage. I have overcome the world. Our shepherd wants for our mountaintop experiences to be tranquil interludes or breaks or deep cleansing breaths of seasons. Tranquility comes only one way, is by staying near to the shepherd. Wandering off is never a good plan. Staying close is how we have his perfect peace. For us, how does that translate? Reading his word every day and spending time talking to the Lord and even more listening to the Lord. Now, it's, it's interesting that we should want all of what the shepherd has to give us, but we don't think about actually investing time. It is so important that we give the Lord the best of our day in the morning. I was thinking this morning, I know that we've talked about this many times, but it's easy for this to happen. Like, for example, you know, all of our dads here, you are the head of the family every one of you, and you are like the shepherd of your home. And it is up to you to send your family out with what? With blessings, with prayer. So 
Wives and children should never leave your home without you first praying with them. So important. That has to be what becomes part of our life. And I know that many of us weren't raised that way. You know, that, that wasn't how our parents were raised, and that wasn't how they raised us. But there comes a time where we have to get serious about our relationship with the Lord. You know, we, we have allowed the devil to just put, put this little moon dust over us, thinking that just because we say we're part of God's family, that we're just going to go to heaven automatically. And that's not the case. God says, I'm going to hold you to my covenant. If you will be my people, then I will be your God. I can't be your God if you don't want to be my people. Just how it works. And we can't be his people if we are not reading his word. His word is his will, his character, his plan for us. So without the reading of the word, you are fooling yourself into thinking that you are having a relationship with your shepherd. And then through the word he speaks to us, and we need to listen because God says, my sheep hear my voice. If you're not hearing from your God, you're in trouble. He wants to speak to you. He loves you. Remember the little lamb being held? He, he doesn't have to yell. If you're close, he speaks tenderly. And he tells you what needs to be in your life, what needs to go, what needs to come. And so it's so important that if we want to have tranquility, if we want to have peace in our lives, if we want to have a real relationship with our shepherd, we need to read the word and we need to spend time in prayer so that we can listen and hear what he is saying to us. It is an incredible privilege to be in a relationship with the creator of the universe who also happens to be our shepherd. Wow. Our shepherd has gone before us. There is nothing that he has, that he sends us to or that he wants us to walk through that he has not been through himself. No matter what happens in our lives, he understands. The Bible says he is a man of sorrows, acquainted with our pain and our suffering. Jesus was born as a baby, walked to life the way that we do, helpless little infant, totally dependent on the care of someone else. He was tempted beyond what you and I will ever be tempted to do and was faithful to the covenant between him and his father. Jesus experienced grief. Remember when he came up to Lazarus' tomb and Mary said, Lord, if you'd been here, he would not have died. And Jesus was overcome by the grief there of, of his beloved friend Lazarus dying. And, and the Bible says Jesus wept. He understands grief. He also knows what betrayal's like. Not just Judas and Peter by, by countless people that just followed him because they thought he could bless them. And when, and when the bread stopped coming, then they totally turned their backs on him and they rejected him. So he knows what rejection feels like. Jesus understands wanting a cup to pass. You know, you and I will all have to eventually drink of a cup that, that we don't want to drink of. And Jesus certainly understands that. You know, for us, it will be the cup of death because it's the, the thing that sheep fear the most. We're made to live. And so death is not becoming for any of us. However, the Lord has gone before us, and he was willing to say, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. He paid our restitution. Jesus suffered and paid my restitution so that I can spend eternity with him. Injustice, have you ever been dealt an unjust hand? Not like Jesus. By his own people. They tried him in a mock trial and sentenced him to death. And then he cared more about me and you than his own life. And he was willing to be separated from the Father and the Holy Spirit, said to both of them, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he didn't change his mind, and he could have. 
But because of his love for us, for you, he was willing to take that step. When he was on the cross, we were on his mind. Each one of us. This is how he could do what he did. The shepherd is incredible. Our shepherd was our lamb. I want to look at in the presence of mine enemies. When, when David says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Let's just look at a few enemies that we have. I mean, just trouble of every single kind that can possibly come that can steal our peace and that can absolutely turn our lives upside down. Any kind of affliction that we can do is sometimes it's physical affliction, sometimes it's mental affliction, sometimes it's just our own sinful nature. I mean, I get sick and tired of dealing with myself. I'm afflicted with my own self. Distress that comes maybe at the hands of others or through circumstances that happen to us. And then there's always grief of some, of some sort that we're dealing with. When the Bible says prepare, the word prepare in the Hebrew language means to arrange to set in order, to furnish, to ordain. God is preparing something special. He is setting things in order for me. Isn't that exciting? That in your journey where he is taking you, he is going ahead, he is arranging things for you, individually for you, personally for you. God gives us lavish provision right in the midst of our trouble. That is what David is saying. While we are under attack, he is providing for us. This was like a huge revelation for me, this, this part, because I look back and I'm like, wow, yes, Lord, you have always been faithful. How does God provide for us in the midst of attack, in the midst of struggle? Comfort. He comforts us one-on-one. -on -one. He is willing to, to just wrap his arms around us and provide what we need. He loves us that much. He provides brothers and sisters. He provides family. Our families at home and our families here. That is a huge provision, huge. The, the biggest gift that God gives us other than himself and his presence is a gift of relationships. Our greatest blessing is our relationships. And God gives and sends his sheep that have had similar experiences to comfort us, to lift us up. It's, it's priceless. And he gives us friends, friends at work, friends that we meet in different places. Yes, he provides for us. What will we do without food? Yes, that's right. He gives us lavish food in our time of trouble. And this is big. I, I thought about this. He gives us people that are trustworthy at work. I'm thinking what a huge blessing that is, that I have women that I work with that love God and that I can trust. You know how huge that is to, to work with someone that you trust? This also can be one of our valleys when it's the opposite. God gives us validation in the midst of our trouble. He says, good job, in his own way. I know because I experience it all the time. When God knows that I need to have a pat in the back, he says it. It's, I, I hope that you know what I'm saying, is that in some way, he shows you that he is pleased even with tiny little things. It may be something, he may send one of the other sheep, his other sheep to come and, and to give you a, a pat on the back. Or he might send you a text or an email through someone that you haven't heard from. God just gives favor and he validates and he says, you're doing a good job. Keep walking, keep pressing, keep persevering. And then he gives us rest. We have a place to lay our heads at night, right? Jesus didn't have that. He says he doesn't have a place for his. But we do. He gives us physical rest. All of these things. God lavishes his love in the midst of 
the trouble. While we are under attack, we have to remember that in the days to come, this will be so important. I want you to think about this scene. This is, this is where David, this is the end of his psalm, you know, as far as they've arrived here. And they're at the mountain range. The sheep are all grazing. They've had an amazing journey. They're having this nice rest of a season being moved on these uh, tablelands of just amazing pasture. And just, I was looking at this and relishing these times with the Lord. And the first scripture that came to me was from Psalm 63. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Better one day in the presence of the Lord, knowing his mighty power, than to spend countless days elsewhere. But as I, but as I contemplated this, I'm like, no, Lord, the scripture that comes to mind is this one. One thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. To see that beautiful scene is to say, I never want for this to end. I want to be in his presence, no matter where it is, in the valley, in the valley, or in, on the mountaintop. I want to be in my Savior's presence. There I have everything I need. There he restores my soul. No matter where I'm walking, he is with me. He knows what's coming. He's prepared for me. And he is going to help me get through any situation that comes by my own choosing or by someone else's choosing. He is going to get me through there. He's going to take me to a secure place. His love for me is boundless and lavish. I can depend on him. And all I want to do is stay right there with him. That's where I want to be. So read this with me in closing. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. May you know his beauty more deeply today.